society that gave birth to our struggle, and that the unity of our organizations was a condition for the success of the struggle. No struggle is without its challenges, detours, and even cool the sun. It is the crucible where learning takes place. Indra experienced these moments. He learned and he continued to grow, but always bound by a deep understanding that without an organized force, without an organization to lead the struggle, there could not be a successful revolution. And our revolution is still work in progress. That is what grounded the dedication to the movement led by the AIDS, and that is what configured Indris's discipline. There was a time when I was a boarder at Amma's home, pretending to be uninvolved in the freedom struggle. Again, not by choice, but by instructions from Comrade Amad Katrar. Indras and his other colleagues in the TIC and TIYC were mobilizing to pick up certain persons from the leadership of the TIC and wanted Amma to head the petition. Amma insisted that I be present and decided against signing the petition. My advice was not to the liking of Indras and his co-conspirators. Yes, I see at least one of those who was in the printing unit would be present here today. And they threatened to beat the hell out of me. I see the price of comrades. Indris's personality, his activism, the choices he made, and the manner in which he confronted those consequences were also shaped by the world and the country in which we lived and struggled, as well as by his interaction with his comrades. The decision of the ANC in 1949 to develop into a mass nation organization dovetailed neatly with a similar tradition that had become part of the struggle waged by the Indian community. The challenge of those days, therefore, became the need for cadres committed to working with the people wherever they lived and labored, to facilitate them in their efforts to unite in action, to share their pains and their joys, to stand guard over them so that they may celebrate their small victories, to grieve with them at their setbacks, and to occupy the front line to shield the people from the blows of the enemy, to protect and defend the people when they were under attack. Indras joined the struggle as a foot soldier and grew into the cadre that the times demanded. He was in his element when working at the grassroots. He brought a passion to all that he did. If there were leaflets to be distributed, Indras would be there. If there were people to be mobilized, Indras would be on duty. If there was a demonstration to be organized, Indras would be in the thick of it. If there was a party going, nothing would stop Indras from being present. And if there was singing going on, you could be sure to pick up his lusty voice, less for its musicality than his inability to hold a note. By the way, do you know that he was a member of the People's Choir in Johannesburg, and the conductor tolerated his participation on the condition that Indras only mine. <laughs> when prisoners in the communal section were allowed to play outdoor sports, Indras became the secretary of the Wakana Soccer Association, together with another guluva, Sunny Singh, as deputy secretary. Is he here? Because let it not be said that I'm speaking behind their backs. They assiduously put together detailed rules for players and referees, and they adjudicated the enforcement of those rules. FIFA had nothing on them. Indras, whose only knowledge of rugby was that the ball was over, decided he was going to play rugby. And during his very first match, as he leapt up to gather a high ball, he was beautifully tackled in mid-air. Indras was carried off the ground with a fractured drip. His rugby career lasted five minutes. I guess he was entitled to put on his CV that he played and he enjoyed playing rugby. Indras was argumentative. Not for nothing was his nickname Talker. 
But now, that's a bit rich coming from me. Isn't that not? So let me not drudge up any arguments that I was privy to. But let it be known that interest never allowed arguments to become a war. And his friendship towards me was such that he would unhesitatingly stand in front of me to take the bullet that had my name on it. So, so from all perspectives, Indras was a people's person, a person most suited to working amongst the people and fully attuned that people are the fulcrum of change, social change. That was his forte. In April 1973, he was released under severe restrictions into a South Africa in the grip of a sullen silence imposed by the relentless repression. He quickly saw the possibility of drawing people together around the second anniversary of the murder of Ahmad Timor. And at his instigation, there came to be the Ahmad Timor Committee, which organized the commemoration in December 1973. And it quickly transformed itself into the Human Rights Committee and became part and parcel of the early revival of overt political activity. That was the type of cadre the movement needed. It's the type of cadre the liberation struggle had nurtured and cultivated. No amount of repression would silence him and no amount of restrictions would restrain him. Wherever he found himself, be it in the thick of mass action, in enforced fear in the atmosphere of repression and restrictions, in prison or in faraway Europe. There were things to do, tasks to perform, to revive, to strengthen, and prosecute the struggle. He was the true definition of an activist. Not just a person engaged in action, but one who strives to replicate himself, creating more activists amongst the people. And in the first democratically elected parliament, Indra served as senator. He relished the opportunity, though to be quite frank, I do not think that he was suited to nor enjoyed the task of devising, crafting legislation and considering the appropriateness of the chosen word or the placement of a comma and a full stop. Looking over my shoulder, I do not think we as a movement were ready or had the resources to separate and simultaneously attend to the challenges of policy making, law making, governance, as well as ensuring that both governments and the ANC's dynamic nexus with the people was enhanced. And so, as we say, let us commit ourselves to being servants of the people, dedicated to rapidly advancing the people's lives, all our people's lives, materially, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. I recall, colleagues, one of the songs that Idris loved to sing. It's an Afro-American spiritual, and it begins, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, going to study war no more, no more. Do not think for a moment that Idris is relaxing in a rocking chair. We know Madiba and Sisulu competed to open a branch of the ANC in their new abode. Sisulu beat him to it. The breaking news is that they have enrolled Indras, and while we on earth labor on, knowing that they are watching over us. Hamba Gaste, Comrade Indras Naidu, Kawe Lamantau. Thank you very much, Colonel Mack. We are now going to hand over to the ANC Paul Beras to remove the ANC flag. And as they do that, or immediately thereafter, I will hand over to the next program director of MC, Nandi Mayachula Kozanchu, who is responsible for the official program. The flag will be handed over to Comrade Yek Maharaj, who will then hand over to the kids. Over to the Pondoras. And as they do that, we can sing Hamagatlan Kondoras.
Amanda. As I descend the stage, I wish to take the honor of thanking both the family and the AC for having given me this opportunity of being a program director. As junior as I am, you will all agree with me that I do not qualify to preside over a, a, a service of a standard of our liberation movement. They should have identified any other person, but I am honored and I wish to, to be thankful for that. I now hand over to Comrade Nandi for the next session. She's the one who will be calling in the sub team to come and take the coffee. Thank you. Thank you very much to the program director. Long live the spirit of Comrade Peter Snyder. Long live. Long live. Amanda. Amanda. All power. Thank you very much. We will continue to celebrate the life of Comrade Peter Snyder. And because we are not managing time, hear much from us. We will allow the speakers to speak. I think we've done very well since morning in terms of management of time. Well done to all the speakers before this time. Protocol also has been observed. The family, the leadership here, national, provincial, and local leadership from government, comrades who are here, friends of the Nike family, Everyone here has been observed. Allow me therefore to continue with the program of celebrating the life of Comrade Idris Naidu by indicating firstly that uh, our premier could not make it. She, he, he got sick uh, from his way from Rastenberg to Johannesburg, so he sent his apologies this morning. But he is well represented by the MEC, MEC Mamabudo here with us. But we want to thank the premier for ensuring that the President of the Republic of South Africa accepts that we have a provincial official general service for Comrade Idris Naidu. I would like to therefore call upon the chaplain to come and declare this service, the official funeral service uh, for us. Captain Buroto will come and do that. And thereafter, we will have some uh, who will wrap the coffin with the South African national flag. And as they do that, we will have the band just rendering an item for us very quietly. Over to you. Thank you, Program Director. The declaration of the funeral will be done by uh, Captain Kizen in the place of General Parasi, Captain. Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Protocol observed. This funeral is declared a provincial funeral according to the Honorable President of the Republic of South Africa, Honorable J. G. Zuma. The funeral is now declared a provincial official funeral. Thank you.
to the event in the 10th of the South African Police Service. We will now call upon a member of the family, Mr. Kuben Naidu, who is the nephew of the Comrade Naidu, and he is also a son of the Prema Naidu. We are sensitive of his year with the family. Please come to us. Good afternoon, comrades, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Program Director, MEC Nandi Maitula Kosa, Acting Premier, Cabinet Ministers, uh, comrades and friends. I've been asked to speak on behalf of the Nandi family at this official state provincial funeral. It is always difficult to do justice to a person's life in a short speech. It is especially difficult because Indres was a larger-than-life character a boundless personality, a courageous freedom fighter, a father, a brother, a son, an African, a committed member of the Congress movement. It is also difficult because in this story is but one chapter in a series of chapters spanning over four generations of family members, of family members who fought colonialism, racism, exploitation, and injustice. The family's history is both well-known and better described by others. My task today is to show how Indres' life and the family's struggle more generally is intertwined with the culture, traditions, and values of the Congress movement. Indres' story and the legacy he leaves provide us with many lessons to draw from, which are pertinent to today's struggle for social justice and equality. From about 1886, for the next 70 years, the political tradition of the family was one of passive resistance. The term passive resistance is a bit of a misnomer because there was nothing passive about it. It was active, militant, brave, courageous resistance to a series of unjust laws, resistance characterized by non-violence. Indres's father, Roy Naran Sami Naidu, aligned himself strongly to the Yusuf Dadi grouping in the Indian Congress, a bloc that was youthful in nature, militant, and committed to working with Africans. Roy set the foundation for the political ideology of the family, and that was that the struggle against the oppression of the Indian people was integrally linked to the struggle of the African people. The cornerstone of ideology of the Naidu family, the Naidu Pele family, was non-racialism and the liberation of the African people. Indres was born into the struggle and became an activist from as young as he could walk, distributing leaflets with his dad, shouting slogans at meetings, making sandwiches for his sisters, preparing to go into jail. The death of his dad, Roy, only served to strengthen the resolve of the family to fight what had then become formally known as apartheid. Indres had to juggle his intense political activity with the need to leave school to work as the breadwinner for the immediate family of Amma and four other young children. He literally put bread on the table by day and organized by night. By 1960, Indres was already an experienced activist, serving on the executive of the Transvaal Indian Youth Congress and was a member of the Communist Party's underground structures. Reji Valia, who, who started his political activity on these very steps of City Hall, recruited Indres into Kotyo Esizwe in 1962. This unit fell under the overall command of Isu Shiva, who was a platoon commander and on the MK High Command at the time. In this decision, while Indres was incredibly excited about joining MK, his decision could not have been an easy one, as Indres was raised in a family with deep traditions of non-violence. Indres was a vegetarian at the time, a hallmark of the non-violent Satyagraha tradition of the family. Indres's induction into the armed struggle marked the second phase of resistance for both the Congress movement and for the family. By Indres' own admission, they were amateurs, with no experience of handling weapons or explosives. In 1963, while planting a bomb at New Canada Railway Station near Soweto, which was their second operation, the unit was betrayed by an informant. Indres, Reggie Vandia, and Shirish Nanabai were arrested. 
in rest was shot in the shoulder during the arrest by an infamous policeman named Roy Ruiz Swanepoel. After Indres's conviction in 1963, he was sentenced to 10 years on Robben Island. The Congress movement went through a very dark period with its leadership either in prison or in exile. Mass mobilization local Libya smashed. Conditions on the island were harsh. On the island, Indres, as he was off the island, a troublemaker, often getting into trouble with wardens. I quote directly from Indres' book, Island in Change, to give you a sense of both the spirit of Indres Island and the nature of brutality of Robben Island. I was amongst the first few prisoners who were given lashes on Robben Island, says Indres. The warders came up to me, one of the Claynine's brothers, who was saddest, absolute saddest. The eldest one came up to me and said, I must go to the pool of dirty, stinking, stagnant water and drain the water in the quarry. I went there and I started draining the water when he said, no, no, take off your shoes and get into the water. I said, no, there is no way I'm going to get into the dirty, stagnant water as there was fine gravel stone in there. You could get cut and it wasn't safe, so I refused. On returning to prison that evening, he reported me to Lieutenant Nodier, saying that I refused to work and I disobeyed a lawful command. I was then charged for disobeying a lawful command, and the final result was I was sentenced to stroke. They tie your hands on both sides and your feet down there. You are stark naked. They put a padding on your back and a padding on your thigh, exposing your buttock only. The warder who did the caning could easily have weighed 100 kilos and was over two meters tall. He chose one of six or seven canes. After testing the cane, he said, I'm going to make a coolie cry today. The first shot that landed, landed right in the middle of my buttock. It cut my buttock down the middle. I felt the pain, but I kept my mouth shut and held on. The water then applied iodine, which was even worse because the iodine burnt you. The fifth one landed right on the first cut, cutting me even deeper, and they again applied iodine. They loosened me, and I felt that if I put my clothes on there, I would faint immediately. So I just grabbed my clothing, walked to my cell with my clothing, and it was only when I got to my cell that I fainted." Unquote. Amma regularly went to Cape Town to see her son, with each visit bringing both pain and joy. Murti and Prema both took their new wives on their respective honeymoons to Robben Island to visit Indus. It gave the term an island honeymoon a new definition in our family. While Ibrahim was in prison, Shanti was arrested several times, but the detention in 1969 was the most was particularly brutal. She was tortured severely, served a sentence for refusing to testify against her friend and comrade Winnie Mandela. In 1973, Ibrahim was released to a hero's welcome. And even though he was under house arrest, the Naidu households regained its reputation as a home where activists and the families of Robben Islanders could come for a delicious meal and an intense political discussion. In fact, many, in fact, visiting the household, the Naidu household was dangerous because of the many activists who frequented 18A Rocky Street. John Caddy Mang relates a story of how an underground unit was having a meeting at the house when another group of activists came over for lunch and exposed them as being part of the underground. After Indres' release, the Naidu household also regained its reputation as a host of large, wonderful parties that would go on until the early hours of the morning. During this period, Indres met Shada, got married, and had bra. I was two years old when Indres was released from prison, and I was about five, five and a half when Indres went back into exile. Two memories stand out for me from that early period. The first was how Indres would line up all of Amma's grandchildren and put the records of Don McLean or Miriam Makeba onto the Bang & Olofsson hi-fi system that he had bought and forced us to learn the words of all these songs. He loved his music. The second memory was how each Sunday the three brothers would buy the Sunday newspapers and go to the gardens of Melrose Temple, which was the only place that Indres could go to outside of the house because of his house arrest. Uh, the, the adults would read, the three brothers would read the newspapers on the lawns 
discuss politics while the children, Ram, Zoya, Gagi, Butch and I would play in the stream adjacent to the temple. We have heard from Comrade Nyanda about some of the experiences in Mozambique, and there are others such as Surab and Sami Singh or Mohammed Timo who are better placed than I am to add to those stories. What is clear though is that Mozambique was a difficult time for Inves and his comrades. Many comrades were killed by the apartheid regime, and Brahm and Fran and Sue's young daughter were caught up in a raid on an ANC safe house. Inves was married with Shada did not survive the strains of life in exile. Inres later met Celia and had a daughter, Janine, in 1986. In the late 1980s, Inres was instructed by the ANC to leave Mozambique, was posted to the GDR where he stayed until returning from exile. There he met Gabi, who was his partner until he died. During this dark period, the exile period, Shanti and Ramni were forced into exile, with both Murti and Prema continuing their political activity under clandestine circumstances. The exile years were difficult for everyone, but particularly for Amma, Indres' mother. Indres was based in Mozambique. Shanti, Ramni, and their spouses were based in London. Sean had joined MK and was serving in some ANC camp on the continent. He moved around. Um, he also had a teaching stint at Solomon Mashlango Freedom College. While Natalia was studying medicine at the Patrice de Mumbai University in Moscow. So the family was scattered all over the show. Murti, first detained in 1965, was again detained during the 1980 school boycotts for a lengthy period. Frema was repeatedly detained and brutally tortured during the 1980s. He, along with Shirish Nanabai, was sentenced for harboring, in 1982 for harboring an ANC escapee. Those familiar with the history of the ANC will know about the four pillars of the struggle mass mobilization, international pressure, armed resistance, and underground activity. The family participated in all four of these pillars in various forms or another. Following the unbanning of the ANC, the family was finally reunited in the early 1990s with all five siblings together in Johannesburg for the first time in decades. For us as youngsters, we got to know Indres again when he returned from exile. Indres was the life of the party, always cracking jokes, teasing the kids, and insisting on what music was played. The Vienna Hi-Fi system had survived and he continued to play his excellent music collection on him. It was during this time that I had long discussions with Indres about politics, Africa, socialism, football and music. When South Africa was readmitted to the International Football Fraternity, Indres was convinced that most African countries would trash Bafana Bafana. Am I on time or Three minutes. I protested strongly. We had the Galactico team. We had Dr. Kumalo and Vidu Tobi. Who would beat us? Indres recognized in the young being a South African superiority complex that he did not like. He was convinced that most African countries would crash us. I watched the first game that South Africa played together with Indres, the first competitive game against Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe beat us 4-0, no, and Indres had made a point. South Africa's arrogance was a bit misplaced. We had long debates about international affairs. I'll skip the first debate because of the chair standing next to me. The second debate was more serious and closer to home. Joe Strobo had written his now famous pamphlet on why socialism had failed in Eastern Europe and in other parts of Africa. I felt that Indres was unquestioningly loyal to the Soviet Union. We had lengthy debates on socialism and the future of socialism. My argument with Indres was that it was not possible to define a new socialism for South Africa without a deep examination of why socialist regimes in Europe and Africa had failed, why accountability broke down and why corruption became rampant. The collapse of socialism and the Eastern Bloc deeply affected Indres. Indres was a firm supporter of the non-aligned movement and passionate about countries that stood up to imperialist bullying. When Natalia a few weeks ago told him that the U.S. was about to lift the embargo on Cuba, his face lit up like a Christmas tree. In this election to, 1919, to Parliament in 1994 marked a new phase in the struggle, in Indres' struggle, but in that of the family. They are part of the democratic order, and Indres contributed his values to the, 19, to the Constitution that was adopted in 1996. 
Up to 94, the family threw themselves into public office. Prema became the first democratically elected mayor of the south of Johannesburg, which includes Soweto, and is presently the ANC chief whip in, in Johannesburg. Tava and Nava, who were active in the underground, uh, with Nava going on to become a senior official in the Tuane Metro Council. Super 3 now works for the National Treasury, following stints in local government and provincial government. Sean, who joined the NB, SANDF when he returned, now works for the city. Natalia became a legend in the fight against HIV AIDS at Baraguana Hospital. Dougie is now a school principal, which works in it for an NGO in the AIDS sector, while Zoya works for Minnesota Sans Frontier. Ram worked for an international development organization before returning to Mozambique, and Janine is working to become an architect, working her way to the next Zay projects. There are many more who I've left out, and I apologize. Two more friends. The past few months have been difficult for the family. Literally a roller coaster ride of emotions. As Idris' health fluctuated, Reggie was like a brother to Idris passed away recently. Isis Bamni's husband passed away in December. Idris' admission to hospital had given greater access to the family to Idris. Absolutely everyone who visited Idris in the past few months spoke of how Bam's return to Idris' side had lifted him physically and mentally. I, together with my wife and kids, visited Indres about a month ago, and we were joined by Mama Timol and his wife, Julie. Indres was frail, but in good spirits. He teased me about where my hair had, my hair had gone, and he teased Kimaya about who had stolen her front teeth. We are grateful to the SAMD for the health care and support that they offer. The state of our country is not healthy. Millions of South Africans remain trapped in poverty. The gap between rich and poor is getting wider by the year. While our government has done well on many fronts, millions more suffer the indignity of joblessness. Corruption is widespread. Worryingly, the slow, painstaking process that Indres has given his life of building a non-racial society is encountering significant headwinds. Indres and all of our fallen comrades sacrificed massively for our opportunity to mold the country in the vision of the Freedom Charter. Our family remains deeply committed to the values enshrined in the Constitution, values of the Congress movement. We remain loyal and disciplined leaders of the movement. Indres of life and the lives of the Naidu and Kale families are deeply woven into the fabric of the Congress movement. As we celebrate the life of Indres and we say our farewell, there is a need to recommit to the traditional values of the Congress movement, which can now be found in the Constitution. Only the highest standards of ethics, honesty, integrity, accountability can ensure that the triple challenge of poverty, inequality, and unemployment are tackled effectively, and a truly non-racial, non-sexist, prosperous, democratic society can be built. That is the struggle that Tambi Naidu fought for. That is the struggle that Amma and Naran Sami Naidu fought for. Indres and his siblings have fought for. Hamba Kashle Indres, you have fallen, but we, the next generation, will pick up your spear and continue to struggle for a more just and equitable world. Aluta, continue on. Thank you very much, Mr. Hoover. We are back to you for me standing here and hear the speech. Since I did, we can't be here to wait. Thank you very much for the moving speech. We apologize to the family for presenting us, but we are going to make time. Our next speaker is a friend to both Comrade Davis and Comrade Gabriela. And uh, this is Mr. Ronald Schwarz, Comrade Ronald Schwarz who is a very good friend of the family. And he is the head of the department here in the House of Commons for the Department of Transport and Roads. Over to you, Mr. Program Director, MEC Mario Tupac Kosa. Since all protocol has been observed, I think I'll launch straight into 
a tribute for English. So let me first extend my family's condolences to the Knight family for the loss of a brother, father, uncle, cousin, and friend. Painful as it may be, you can take comfort from the fact that many people across this country share your grief. I want to start this tribute with the first two lines from a poem by Louisa May Alcott. And I quote, I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and found that life was beauty. This expresses the essence of Ulysses' attitude and commitment to the struggle for democratic South Africa and the organization that led the struggle, the African National Congress. At no point would English tolerate the negative criticism of the ANC and its leadership, always maintaining that the movement knew what it was doing. Too many people have spoken about India, so I will not repeat what many of you said, but I want to emphasize some of them. As you now know, interest was sent to the former GDR, where he worked with activists, activists from the anti-apartheid movement, and where he met Yabu Rankenberg, who he met, rather who fell in love with. On the insistence of her parents, they exchanged vows, and many years later, back in South Africa, they did the same again in Cape Town. Over the more than 25 years of Jenny and my friendship with Idris and Gabi, it was the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, that we witnessed a dramatic change in his life with the onset of his illness. The last time we saw him was on New Year's Eve, when being so weak, all he could do was lift his hand in greeting. As many people have, say, have said, once the life of the party and never at the loss for words, we found a situation now where Indris refused to leave the safety and familiarity of his home. Only sometimes when it was absolutely necessary, I remember like the time when we had the big fires like we do on Devil's Peak at this point, when he was forced to, to, to leave and to do overnight at our place in Seapoint. Despite the, de the deterioration in his health, Indris kept a positive outlook on life and retained a great sense of humor, and many times we would find ourselves crashing with laughter at his sharp wit, wit and dry humor. And during this time, Indris relied on several things to keep his spirits up but I will only highlight one or two. One was, of course, the most important constant in his life at this point, and that was Gabi, his wife, the woman who stood by his side in dangerous and exciting times, but more importantly, he would remain at his side in his time of greatest need. His devotion to and love for her and hers for him was inspiring to witness. As a communist to the end, Indra's loved a good story, as I'm sure all of you know. Especially to concern working class and communist struggles. One of these that he really loved to tell, and he told us this over and over at different times, was the story of the of a movie of the Bandera Rosa or the Italian communists who fought against Mussolini's fascism during World War II. Now, what he really loved about this story was the part that he always told us about two comrades planting a bomb on a railway line. And they then leave the scene with their arms across each other's shoulder, singing the, the theme of the song, Bella Ciao. And as Comrade Mack has mentioned, Indra's address was toned in, but that didn't stop him from singing the song 
at the top of his voice. Translated as Goodbye My Beautiful, the song has this message. And I think it's also very apt to interest in how he lived his life and his dreams for the future. It goes as this, and please, I'm not seeing the song, I'll just highlight some of, some of the, the, the lyrics of the song. And I quote, One morning I woke up and found the invader. Oh, partisan, carry me away, for I feel I'm dying. And if I die as a partisan, you have to bury me, but bury me up in the mountain, under the shadow of a beautiful flower. And the people who will pass by will say to me, what a beautiful flower. This is the flower of the partisan who died for freedom. I'm coming to concluding. In much the same way, as we heard him just ask Gabi many times, he explained what he wanted to happen when he died. He asked Gabi to scatter his ashes on Robben Island. And although he did not say this, it was clear that this for him would be his final victory over one of the most feared symbols of apartheid repression. So let me conclude by quoting the rest of the poem by Louisa May Alcott. Was thy dream then a shadowy lie? Toil on sad art courageously, and thou shalt find thy dream to be a noonday light and truth to thee. Thank you, Gabi, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabi also asked me to, to do a vote of thanks as she feels that she is not able to do so without breaking down. Dear comrades and friends, I thank you all for coming together here today to say farewell to my husband. I want to thank God and my ancestors for bringing Indris and I together in this life. In Indris, I have met one of the greatest souls of my lifetime, and we had many wonderful and happy days together, and many rough days as well. But our love carried us through and all ended well, and our life together was a successful and blissful love story. For me personally, it became very hard when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I started losing the man I loved a little more day by day. He had many other ailments, but as the Alzheimer's progressed, I became lonelier without my illness. I want to thank my Sangoma family for their support through the most trying last 10 years of his life, particularly Matongo Makorsi. I would like to mention all the people by name that supported Indris and I over these 10 years. They provided me with strength, encouragement, spent time and energy with us, and helped me with caring for my husband. If it was not for these people and their love, this challenging journey would have been even more difficult for me. I thank you from the bottom of my heart and with all my being. She then goes, to list on, uh, goes on to list a number of people that she would like to thank. Starting with my son, Tobias Blankenberg, who was there every day for the last eight years, and whenever he was needed, day or night, he was available. Mac and Zarina Maharaj, Ibrahim Lindenfeld, known in Cape Town as Sledge and his family, Ronald and Jenny Swartz, Barbara Hogan and Ahmed Katrada. She wants to thank the medical staff who assisted over the last time, and they listed as follows. A wonderful GP, Dr. Adelaide Andrade, who never hesitated to respond to our calls day or night. 
Thanks to Dr. Wolf and all of the staff at Gardens Medic Clinic. All the staff at St. Luke's, Hosp uh, St. Luke's Hospice, the staff of the Cape Retirement Lifestyles, Dr. Mar Kalan, all the staff of number two military hospital in Weinberg, Cape Town, and more importantly, and here I'd like to add also for myself, the staff of the Department of Military Veterans, and particularly in the last few days, Agnes Nawan. Colleagues, uh, I think for many veterans, it is a difficult thing knowing where to go to for, for assistance. I should say that the Department of, of Military Veterans are well organized in terms of the services and support that they provide. But it, it seems that sometimes uh, people don't know who to contact. Um, and so I want to particularly thank the, the department when we contacted them for support when Gabi needed it near towards the end, they were very quick to respond and provided very good support at a time when she needed the most. The other people she would like to thank is the late Ishmael and Kathy Patel, Vijay Fadiachi and family, Majaj and Balakazi and Dengi, Jamela and Bob Lomas, Horst and Christine Kleinschmidt, Sunny Stout Rostin and Brian Rostin, Andrea Ploss, Pavitri Fule, Parmesh Rod, Malisha and Liam Everett, Petra and George Carmen, Janet Unity, Uwe Marnitz, Ma Moritz von Kos, Arvind Jahajia, Hussein Bismillah, Laurel and Chenya Dagaban, Colin and Danny Kluter, and last but not least, Sipo Watstix Mabuz. If I have forgotten to mention anyone, please forgive me in this time of sorrow. Indras and my gratitude is extended to all people mentioned. To Indras, my love, thank you for sharing for you, saying thank you for sharing your life with me. And know that your spirit will live on in all of us whose heart you have touched. I love you so much. Ambaga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts, for those ways of speaking. Let us also thank uh, Gabriele for the words that we will be speaking by to the London Pastors. Thank you very much, Mr. We are now going to have some music. We have been open on order to join the Tennessee for that presentation. May we have that song a special song to the family.
Thank you very much. I think we got two songs. These are very special songs to the family, especially to the one of Comrade Inglis. She says that Inglis actually sang the first song, which is uh, uh, De La Chiao, pardon me for the pronunciation. Uh, it was said this song at all times, when, whenever he felt it was opportune for him to sing this song. But the second song that we got was then the Ode to Joy. Thank you very much for that. Let us then continue, ladies and gentlemen, without any further waste of time, by allowing us to read the message of condolence from our former president. Uh, Mr. Tabo Baby, who is here with us, together with his wife, and he brings that. Dear comrades and friends, it's addressed to the Nairobi family. It was with great sadness that we heard the news that comrade Idris Nairobi has passed away. Being fortunate to have known comrade Idris for over 50 years, we have been privileged to have him as one of our dependable comrades in the struggle to defeat the apartheid regime and to build the new democratic South Africa. From the time he came to know him in the late 1960s, Comrade Idris stood out as one among our generation who was ready to make the supreme sacrifice if necessary to help ensure the liberation of all our people from the apartheid tyranny. From those young days, Comrade Ingrid led a heroic life, which has confirmed him as one of our outstanding liberators and an honored co-architect of the democratic and non-racial South Africa to whose men he had committed in his life. As we bid him a final farewell, we owe it to him and others who were his comrades in arms, but are also no longer with us, to ensure that we never betray his legacy, remaining family committed always, selflessly and honestly to serve the people of South Africa. Please accept our sincere condolences and assurance of our support at this moment of sadness and grief. We all sincerely from Mamzalene, Mutatu Tabu, Siabule Nalapu. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to, to call upon the representatives of the housing government representing our Honorable Premier, David Makura. We have with us one of the MEC, MEC Jacob Mamakulo, responsible for human segments and local government. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I know we have loved this song, but uh, please take this approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Directors. Um, Speaker and Toby Mehoe, we see my Twitter course. Allow me first once more as the program director to convey the sincere apology of the Honorable Premier David Makura, who could not join us today. I'm deeply honored on behalf of the provincial government to convey our sincere greetings and condolences to the wife of Comrade Indra Snaidu, Comrade Gabriele Plagenberg the children, members of the family, relatives, and friends of Comrade Indians. Honorable Minister in the Presidency, Comrade Jeff Hadebe, who will also have the opportunity to address us on behalf of President Jacob Zuma, all Honorable Ministers, Deputy Ministers present here, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the ANC, Comrade Jesse Tuat, and all NEC members present, the former Presidents of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Chabombeki, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Halima Makanti, the General Secretary of the South African Communist Party, 
and Minister of Higher Education, Corporate Ratings Demand, and all members of the Central Committee present, the Provincial Secretary of the NC in our province, Comrade Opapo, and members of the PC of Kosachi of Sanko, our veterans present here, Comrade Katrada Maharaj, Comrade Nyanda, and of course, all other veterans. Now, MECs, uh, members of parliament, members of our legislature, uh, acting executive mayor of the uh, city of Johannesburg, uh, Councillor Khriev, all mayors, councillors, uh, and of course, all our security forces. Comrades and friends, today we gather once again to pay our last respects to yet another selfless patriot and freedom fighter, Comrade Indus Naidu, who shared the same trenches with, among others, Uncle Reggie, whom many of you will recall we just buried uh, last year in September. We thank President Jacob Zuma for acceding to our request to grant Comrade Naidu a special provincial funeral service and honor we think he deserves fully as one of those who made an immense contribution to our liberation struggle. We wish to take this opportunity once more to convey our heartfelt condolences to the family of Comrade Naidu, his wife, relatives, and friends. We trust that you will draw comfort in the knowledge that you are not alone in your grave. We too have lost one of our own. We are privileged to have known Comrade Naidu, to have worked with him, and for many in the generation, to have drawn invaluable wisdom and inspiration from him. Comrade Indus Naidu and many like him belong to the illustrious generation of freedom fighters who never cowered to the brutal system of apartheid oppression. Even faced with danger and death to themselves and their families, they refused to abandon the noble and just cause of freedom and justice for all. With Comrade Indus Naidu passing on, death has robbed us the liberation, uh, the liberation movement of one of its finest, most senior, most dependable, most experienced, and most dedicated foot soldier. Through his death, though his death is a hard blow to the entire liberation movement, we however believe that death cannot be cannot be proud for Inas, his ideas, his tactics, his thesis, his proud, his proud legacy will continue to live on. Allow me, program director, to quote. Um, <clears throat> Allow me to quote um, one of the uh, remarks he made during the United uh, Nations Special Committee against apartheid in 1978. He said, open quote, as political prisoners, we were very proud of being on the island. We have demanded nothing short of unconditional release from prison so that we too can play our role in building a new and free South Africa where race, color, sex, or creed will not matter. Comrades and friends, during this period in our country, where the foundations of the non-racial society we are seeking to build have been challenged by irresponsible and insulting statements made by those who are determined to derail the democratic project. Let us be reminded of our historic task to build a new and free South Africa where race, color, sex or creed will not matter. Fellow compatriots, Comrade Indus Knight, who is no longer with us, let us pick up the spear from where he left off. Let us work hard like him. Let us defend and defend his proud legacy. Let us follow in his footsteps. Long live the undying spirit of Comrade Indus Knight. Long live. Thank you very much, Prophet Director. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Tinia. That was very, very good indeed. We thank you for the words of encouragement to the family. We will now ask the subs and uh, the brass band to give us one uh, song, and then after we will then call upon uh, our minister, the presidency, from the Jeff Hadden, and to render the eulogy on behalf of of the presidency.
Thank you. The director of the program, the Naidu family, the wife, Gabriela Plattenberg, the former president, Begi and Monsante, the deputy secretary general of the ANC, Jesse Duarte, the general secretary of the SACP, Lady Zimanda, veterans of the struggle, comrades and friends, ladies and gentlemen. I have been requested by the president to deliver an eulogy on his behalf at this funeral of one of the most unsung heroes of our liberation struggle, Comrade Indus Knight. I'm extending the president's sincere apology for not attending in person because of the engagements related to the 104th celebration of the African National Congress this weekend. Having worked directly with Comrade Andrews on Robben Island in exile, particularly in Mozambique and Lusaka, the President would have loved to attend in person. We wish to thank the President for declaring a special provincial funeral of the late Comrade Indus Knight, who passed away at the second military hospital in Cape Town on Sunday, the 3rd of January, 2016. According to the declaration, the President has directed that the national flags should be flown at half-mast at all stations in the Gauteng province today, the Sunday, the 10th of January, as a sign of respect for this gallant fighter for the freedom of all South Africa's people. Although Comrade Indris had been thrown through all the four corners of the world in pursuit of a struggle to free his people, his life ended on the soil of the city and the province where he started. It is both an honor and a privilege that this city of Johannesburg and this province should be the one that bids farewell to a favorite son he accepted into the world in August 1936. Comrade Indus passing away comes at a time when our nation is grappling with the discourse of racism consuming South African society. His death, painful and untimely as it is, immediately alerts us to the goal of a non-racial country he was prepared to lay down his life for. His was the life that made him a global citizen who felt a human being equal to others, whether in Mozambique, in Sweden, in the German Democratic Republic, or in central Johannesburg. He interacted with all groups as an equal, and his home was open to people of all walks of life, irrespective of their color, irrespective of their station in life. His passing away at this time is a silent yet powerful reminder to those in our society who are stoking the fires of racial hatred. Ingris and his fellow comrades were among the first to be caught in the then transfer while committing sabotage as members of Mukonto Isisre. They were also the first guerrillas of Mukonto Isisre to be sent to Robben Island invading historical space as also the first cadre to be shot by the apartheid forces when they were caught. Indris also exposed the brutality of the regime that did not think it had a duty to first attend to his wounds that had been received after being shot at, at the scene of the sabotage. Instead, he captured us showed disdain for the rules of war, preferring to interrogate him and search his home as he was bleeding from the shoulder wound as we heard from his nephew, Kuben. From this action alone, the moral high ground of our military struggle was established and the poverty of the enemies was exposed. Indeed, as the ANC formally acceded to the Geneva Conventions, 
the apartheid government chose not to bind themselves to those conventions. Comrade Indras survived torture at the hands of the first bench of apartheid security officials who had been especially trained to torture captured freedom fighters in France led by the notorious rulers Swanepo. When Indus recounted this in his interview that he gave to Tor Selstrom on the 7th of, of December 1995, the memories of the wet bed torture method become vivid to those who had suffered the same torture under the regime. When he told of the electric shock method of torture, one had a clear view of how black human life was treated with disdain by those who were given the power to torture prisoners. Prison life was harsh, but there were activities, activities of escapism that psychologically lifted the load of this debilitating life. One such escapism was the game of football under the Magana Football Association to which Ingers provided his consummate leadership skills as a top official. A sports in general, and football in particular, was added a new front which was used to rock the apartheid establishment outside prison. Polkar prisoners also had to fight for the right to play their favorite game. Campaigning ceaselessly for the right to use the abandoned patch of land to play the game, there was always going to be conflict with prison authorities who wanted to interfere with their right to recreate. Outside prison, city authorities were refusing African football clubs access to city sports facilities. They controlled access and exit to the cities through separate amenities and cafe times for blacks to be in towns and in the cities. Out of this adversity of managing an association and playing football within prison walls, the administrative capacity that came from those who were in charge of the Makana Football Association can still be felt today. It is possible that one of the considerations that the FIFA World Cup was awarded to South Africa in 2010 might have been the strong linkages that the sport of football had with the political leadership that emerged from Robben Island. The late Steve Tretter, who drafted the constitution of the association, became the Minister of Sport in President Mandela's cabinet. Our current Deputy Chief Justice, Justice Musanegi, was also an administrator of that association. Indeed, this association and the football rivalry amongst inmates is well documented in Indus book, Island in Chains. Comrade Indus and his prison comrades had the mental strength to fight against a prison system that was meant to humiliate them as a people. The victory for the right to play was accompanied by resistance to humiliating experiences such as being forced to do the practice of Taoism. Using methods such as hunger strikes and protest, Polkar prisoners managed to extract concession after concession from a prison system that was losing its grief as fast as the Polkar establishment that supported him was crumbling. His own sense of struggle was informed by the broadness that cut across racial lines. Having been himself an embodiment of the non-racial character of our struggle, he opened it to white comrades as he did to host Kleinschmidt. In his own tribute to Ingris, which appeared in the Cape Times of 6 January, Mr. Kleinschmidt tells of the manner in which his color was used as a weapon against the very system that was aimed to benefit him. 
One of Tajri's many underground tasks after being recruited by Indus was to hire vehicles for underground work because it was difficult for black people even to hire out cars at the time during apartheid. Recruiting for our organization was what Comrade Indus always did without flinching to such an extent that Island Fan, Alan Fan, who visited the famous Rocky Street House, said he experienced the ANC being discussed relatively openly even during those dark days of restrictions. He also found out that in 92 household, the concept of working for the ANC was conveyed as something fairly natural. Comrade Indris was the one person who spoke energetically of this need to work for the ANC. He was at the beachhead of our armed struggle, having been in the first group in 1961 that raised his hand when it was called upon to do so. The bravery of that first bench of soldiers should be appreciated from the perspective of the strength of the opposition army that we prepared to fight against. Although it was formed by the minority white population, it was a formidable army that had an advantage in conventional combat. The task facing the fledgling but bold MK recruits, known as the sabotage group, was daunting, having first to embark on diplomatic mission of soliciting support, while at the same time training a new army for the tough task ahead. The decision to leave your home to fight for your cause is a decision that only patriots and dedicated internationalists make. Therefore, when we examine the role of that first sabotage group, we consider them to be in the same path with the lines of internationalists such as Che Pavara and others. Fellow mourners, when Indras gave an account of their betrayal by a police informer, it did not only highlight the dangers of all armed struggles, infiltration, but also the need to singularity of peoples achieve the goal of liberation. In this, and his comrade, Sharif Nanabai, Reggie Van Yap, were captured after being waylaid in the manner they were, clearly aware who had betrayed them, but they did not seek revenge. In struggle, revenge is an all-consuming affair as it has the potential to derive from the original purpose of our struggle. Indris and all his comrades understood this. They did not allow themselves to be clouded by a vision about the need to reach the goal when they set out for their people, even when it was at a great personal cost to themselves. Indris should also be credited with the bonds that were established between the people's movement and the white student radical movement of the time. Being consulted and visited by the National Union of South African Students, NUSAS, at that time, the seeds of non-racialism were gradually being planted and nurtured. The fourth pillar of our struggle, as articulated by our former president, Oliver Tambo, related to the international drive to isolate the apartheid regime and to win worldwide support for our struggle. Indris played many roles in this and other pillars, but one comes to mind. Responding to public pressure in the United States, one global company, Polaroid Corporation, through its local agent, Frank and Hitch, sought to continue with their business in South Africa by arguing that their policies were liberal and were assisting the suffering black people of our country. The company responded by sending a delegation to South Africa, which recommended that all sales to the apartheid government be banned, including sales to the military and police. The company also proposed to raise black wages and increase job training for its black employees. To prove that the company was paying lip service to its own promises, 
Ingris provided proof that that company was not assisting blacks, but on the contrary, was continuing to sell its products to the apartheid military. In 1976, the company had requested its black employees to undertake light detector tests, something to which Ingris vehemently rejected and was subsequently fired. In the United States, there were very strong protests against that company, against that company, and it was forced to cease its operation. And once again, Comrade Ingress had made an invaluable contribution to the long struggle of the liberation of his people. Indeed, Ingress will also be remembered for the impassioned plea for the life of Solomon Masangu to be spared delivering his statement to the Special Committee against Apartheid in October 1976. This is what Andrew said, and I quote, The last time the racist regime executed a political prisoner was in 1965. But now, once again, it intends to execute a young patriot, a member of the ANC, Solomon Mashang. Mashang is a symbol of the revolutionary black youth of South Africa, the youth who have joined together with all sections of the oppressed people under the leadership of the African National Congress to fight for a free and democratic South Africa, free from all exploitation. We call upon the international community, upon all democracy-loving people to demand that Foster, Botha and their gang to stop the execution of this patriot. He is a prisoner of war and must be treated under the relevant Geneva Conventions." Close quotes. While Comrade Indus's experience, his skills could have been deployed in various leadership roles in our society. When he retired from parliament in 1999, he chose the line of operating behind the curtains. With his easily approachable disposition, he became a repository of knowledge for many who wanted to hone their skills in leadership. His availability to impart his experience to many who sought his advice was well respected. Like an old uh, adage of our struggle, he was always ready to offer advice, to offer guidance, and those who sought this from him are better for it. Because he directed them towards the need to sustain our organization, he was always an asset towards our organizational renewal. His house here in Jobek was a hive of activity and an ideal meeting place for the sharing of ideas and tactics to advance our struggle. Born into a family of struggling heroes and heroines, Comrade Ingles could not have chosen a different life. With his grandfather having been a student of Mahatma Gandhi and been to prison 14 times, Indra tasted the brutality of the regime firsthand. His grandfather, a founder member and later the first president of the Transvaal Congress, could not have shown another way for his grandson, who would himself excel as a leader of his community, a leader of his people. Indra's grandmother gave birth to her last child in prison, and his father was a very active person. His mother had been an activist all her life, participating in 1956 March to the Union Building, a feat for which she was awarded the Order of the Tuli in silver. His brothers and sisters were all activists in their own right, suffering as they did under the same conditions as their brother, but always there to provide solidarity and comfort amongst themselves. Escaping South Africa at the instruction of the ANC in 1977, Indris was posted in Mozambique, where he played a sterling role in accepting, accommodating, and guiding hundreds of students who joined the exile after the 1976 students' uprisings. Resources were meager, accommodation staff, as we heard from General Nyanda, and the enemy very active. Liaising with fraternal organizations and supporters, 
particularly from the Scandinavian friends, Inves and other leaders did as much as they could to integrate the newly arrived students and activists to their new environment. Although the Umati Accord was sold as a thawing of relations between Swaziland and the apartheid government, the reality is that it also put pressure on the Mozambican government to expel the ANC from Maputo. Andrews, as we have heard, was one of the few that remained there for a short while. I had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time in January 1983 in Maputo, when he took me together with Sun Singh to pay my respect to those who had been killed by the apartheid regime in Matola, including one of my closest friends, Dufuma, Lenskot Hadeb, and Squaya. It does not mean that when he was removed from Maputo to Lusaka, the dangers had been removed. For all comrades, the life of exile was always accompanied by continued vigilance. He was posted to the German Democratic Republic by the ANC, confirming both the strategic importance of the GDR to our struggle, as well as confirming Inz's maturity to deal with such strategic postings. The GDR had been at the forefront of providing assistance and support ahead of many other countries which supported the movement the GDR was amongst the few countries where the ANC had full diplomatic status, and it was correct that we should send some of our best cadres to liaise there in the GDR. Comrade Inves, as Blake has just said, is amongst the few political prisoners who took upon himself to write an account of his life in prison. His book, Island in Chains, covers most of the aspects of his life in the manner that he did. There were a time more than 1,000 prisoners on Robben Island, and by writing this book, Indris was opening an invite to all those more than 1,000 former prisoners to write about their own experiences of the struggle and prison. If these stories are not told by the political prisoners themselves, there will not be a true reflection of the triumph over adversity. Indris did not only write about the struggle as a person, but also contributed to others who wanted to do by being free available for interviews. In order to finish her book, Tracing the Unbreakable Thread, Julie Hendrickson had to interview Indris in Lusaga in 1987. Professor Pedro O'Malley interviewed Comrade Indris in October 2002. He was always available to provide an insight into this or other episode of our struggle so that our triumph over adversity will continue to exist in the minds of the future generations. He is amongst the few of our leaders who have gone full cycle and complete membership of the struggle. Coming from then Transvaal Indian Congress, he moved to Mkondo Isizwe, then to the South African Communist Party. He has served our people's parliament as a senator. He has faced the full might of the brutality of apartheid regime, of incarceration, of torture, of banning, of house arrest, Robben Island prisoner, banned person, and assassination target. There is no doubt that the passing away of combat Indus will leave a vacuum in the polka space. However, because he had the wisdom to record his experiences and was willing to share his views with others, many who will follow will have a repository of knowledge at their disposal to shape their own approaches to political challenges they will face in the future. When Indus participated in the Ahmed Timor Memorial Committee, which was later changed to the Human Rights Committee, his aim was to keep the name of the ANC alive amongst our people. Released from prison, when the apartheid authorities had thought they had sapped our spirit to fight, Comrade Indus came back defiantly to continue where he had ended. By his own example of not letting himself be intimidated by incarceration, through his resilience, under pressure, 
in respecting himself an example of how to keep the ANC among our people. As he joins his commander and comrade Reiki Fandiyab in the new world, we wish to bid farewell to comrade Indus, born into a life of inequality, life of repression on 26 August 1936, who for the rest of his life fought for the freedom of our people. Farewell to a diplomat, farewell to a soldier, farewell to a teacher, farewell to prisoner 885 of 1963, farewell to a senator, farewell to a legislator. As the flags that are dipped in his honor today rise tomorrow, May his soul rest in peace. Lala Rashi Kabani, Amanda Awit. Thank you. Thank you to, to the minister for that transitive uh, to the villages. We will now, uh, before we hand over to, to Captain Buroto, we will uh, announce that lunch will be served here at the city hall after the auditorium. And uh, not everybody is able uh, to, to be at the auditorium because there is very little so we appeal that the family, the friends of the family, the leadership, including our former presidents who are here with us, they are partners, the leadership of the ANC, the leadership of the Alliance, the Sanjus, the SSC, the Sanko, the military veterans, the veterans, the other ones who can be accommodated at the Sumatoja. So we are pleased that not everybody should go there, but rather be here up until lunch is served here at the city hall. I'm told that people have been asking for water, probably forgot to say that there was water.